Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the last lecture of Chem 511, at least the last one from me. The rest of them are going to be led by you guys. Um, you have made it to the top of Mount Separation Science. Uh, you've let me be your Sherpa all semester, uh, guiding you up the treacherous path towards understanding analytical separations. And when we got to the top, waiting for us there was this, uh, you know, fluffy lecture talking about stuff that I think is kind of cool. Uh, and not stuff that's going to tax your brain too hard. So we're not going to go over any math uh, involved in any of this stuff. I just wanted to show you kind of the, the, the place where I spend my career, which is the intersection of separation science and microfluidics. Um, so I'm calling this lecture microchip electrophoresis, um, which is the main separation technique we're going to learn about today, uh, and other cool stuff you can do with fluids and electric fields. Uh, so why? Why other cool stuff, even if that other cool stuff is not separation science? Um, well, because it's my last lecture at UT, right? So so just let me enjoy myself a little. Jeez, let me just show you the stuff that I think is uh, is pretty cool. <clears throat> and uh, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of how miniaturization and, and microtechnology can accomplish some cool stuff. All right, let's jump into this. So um, microchip electrophoresis. So the, the, the big benefit of CE, the thing that CE does really well, are these fast separations. Here, let me turn on this pointer. Hopefully you can see that. These fast separations and small sample volumes. And if you remember back to um, some of the principles of CE that we talked about, it became pretty obvious that we can't go, uh, we can go a little too fast, but really the benefit is all in our favor, at least in terms of peak efficiency, to go as fast as possible, right? We need some finite amount of time to get the bands to separate from the injection plug. But outside of that, the faster we go, the better. And that implies that if we can make these instruments smaller and smaller and smaller, the, the, the separation channel shorter and shorter and shorter, these separations will happen much, much faster. Um, the problem is that instrumentation for CE, like the, the, the big black box that sits on the, the bench top that holds onto a capillary and holds onto a detector and holds onto these vials for sample and applies voltage in the right places, it needs a, a long-ish capillary. It needs about 30 centimeters of capillary. You can, there, you can get them smaller down to about 15 centimeters of capillary. But it needs some capillary to go in the right place to be able to hold on to it, right? And it needs, despite maybe what we've said in class, it needs large, large-ish sample volumes. Um, so what does that mean? The injections are only nanoliters, like we said. Um, but the same, but you know, to get a capillary connected to an electric circuit applied to a sample vial, we need, really need to fill that sample vial up with, you know, a couple hundreds of microliters of sample. So, so although each analysis is on a very small amount of sample, we need quite a bit of it to get it to work. So in the early 90s, um, these guys who are, um, you know, there's a, there's a few different labs, and, and all of the people who worked on this are now, in my book anyways, pretty legendary folks. Um, one of them, uh, did his PhD actually here in our department at UTK. Uh, in fact, technically he did it in what is now my lab. He did his PhD with George Gishan down at the end of the hall. Um, so I'm going to show you some of that work too. We have some papers uh, up here that we're going to just take a peek at. Um, but I want to show you the, the, the way that this started. And, and I'll tell you that miniaturizing CE using these microfabrication techniques, uh, by the way, microfabrication, this is the same types of techniques used to make um, the microprocessors in our cell phones and our computers. They basically lifted those techniques in order to make small fluidic channels to do capillary electrophoresis in. And it was the earliest example, microchip CE was the early example of a much broader field now that we call microfluidics, which we'll get deeper into. So here's what they came up with. This is kind of the first microchip CE um, device, basically. It looks like a microscope slide because it is. It's built on a microscope slide, and we interface with this thing. Our detection is usually by fluorescence microscopy. So you sit this thing on the stage of a microscope. You focus your microscope down here at the end of this channel somewhere, and you see uh, basically the result of your, your separation. We're actually going to look through a microscope in just a minute and look where all the action happens, which is up here. So um, Briefly, I'll tell you what this is all about. So we have this, first of all, this thing is called the cross T. Sometimes it's just the letter T, sometimes they say T. Uh, but this is the cross T device geometry. It turns out to be an extremely versatile geometry for a microfluidic device. So people do all sorts of things in here, um, not just capillary electrophoresis. You could imagine, for example, if you wanted to mix three reagents in very small volumes, you just send them all in this way and they will all mix together as they go down this 
channel right here. The way we're going to look at it is how is this cross geometry used to inject a small plug of sample into this channel where capillary electrophoresis can happen. So let's take a look at how that works. It was really the, the key challenge was to um, uh, figure out a way to get that sample plug injected. So I'm going to show you some videos. These videos appear videos I took when I was in grad school. So these are my own videos. I'm going to show you um, the earliest, most straightforward way of doing this, which is called the pinched injection. We'll see why that name is there in a second. Uh, but basically, here's how it works. These little drilled holes uh, in the glass substrate, uh, this is where you put your sample, that's S, your background electrolyte, and then you have uh, two reservoirs for waste. And because all they are are one millimeter holes drilled in a one millimeter uh, thick microscope slide, the reservoirs here, the equivalent to the sample vials you use in CE, they hold like a microliter, maybe two microliters. So you can do everything that we're watching, um, and you can do a lot of it because the, the volumes inside these channels are really small, right? We have nanoliter volumes inside these channels, so you have about a thousand-fold as much sample as you need. So in theory, you could set this thing up with two microliters of sample and get a thousand-plus separations out of it. Um, Okay, let's take a look at what's happening. So how do you get a small plug of this sample constituent into this channel in order to do a separation? So we're going to look at a video that is zoomed in on that intersection. Before I start it, hopefully you can see on the video, there's kind of this ghostly cross image. That's the intersection that we're looking at. So there's a channel that runs this way, another one that runs this way, and this, the solutions are laid out like they're drawn on this map here. So let's take a look. So this is a fluorescent sample. And the idea is we apply, we start by applying a voltage uh, from the bottom where the sample is, uh, positive voltage, negative voltage up here by the waist. And that drives electroosmotic flow straight up and through this channel. Um, there's a little bit of extra that we're doing here that makes this injection, not just a cross T injection, but a pinched injection. And what that is, is we have a small amount of voltage, a small positive voltage applied down here and down here. So what that does is it takes buffer that's sitting in this channel and buffer that's sitting in this channel, it slowly flows up this way. So what we're actually seeing when this injection plug develops is flow from all three going straight up. The reason we do that, the reason we do the pinching, which wasn't the original design, originally this thing just, you left these what we call floating. If you do that, if there's no flow coming here, then your sample flows through this intersection, but at the intersection, the molecules are free to diffuse out this way. And when they do, uh, you get here, I'll try and pause this. So if you see there's a little bit of overflow, close that. See there's a little bit of overflow right here. We call these the wings. Yeah, there's a little bit less on this side. Um, so the wings are basically where molecules are free to diffuse out this way. Because we have a little bit of flow coming this way, the molecules, the fluorescent molecules uh, diffuse out here and then they get ca caught up in the flow and swept up this way. So that's as much wing as you get. If you didn't have that pinched flow, a little bit of voltage driving a little bit of EOF in either of these directions, what happens is the wings grow with time because there's nothing to stop molecules from just diffusing out. Okay, that's the pinched injection scheme. It was the first technique used, um, actually pinched wasn't, but the cross T injection scheme was the first technique used to make this work. In fact, I can show you the paper. I believe this is the one. Yeah, this is a paper um, by two superstars, Jet Harrison and Andreas Manns. Um, from 1992, so this is about 11 years after original CE was ever described, and they said, hey, you know, we if we design some channels in a microscope slide the right way and apply voltages to drive EOF, it turns out at this little intersection down here, so the cross, uh, I don't know if you can see where my, here's my cursor, the cross down here just above number four is equivalent to this cross right here. It's, it's basically the geometry looks a little different, but it's doing the same thing. Um, and they basically say, yeah, if we if we apply the voltages in the right sequence, we can get a little plug of sample and we can get it into this channel and we can flow down that channel. Okay, so um, that was the, the original concept of capillary electrophoresis in a uh, microchip. Here's an example of their separation that they saw. So what are they separating? Uh, two Just two fluorescent dyes, really simple molecules that, you know, are a model sample. They're not real. Um, like biological sample or anything, but basically they're in a background electrolyte of pH 8.5, fluorescein and calcine, and they're applying just 3,000 volts. This is like an order of magnitude less voltage. Um, so why an order of magnitude less voltage? Well, actually, it turns out you pay a price for this. So <clears throat> um, you'll remember that uh, we have this big challenge in, in microfluidics, or sorry, in, in capillary electrophoresis, and that's dissipating heat. You apply a voltage, 
you get a current and that produces joule heating. Uh, sorry, I'm looking for a figure in here to kind of illustrate something to you. So the shorter these channels are, the higher that field is because it's volts per centimeter. Right? And if you have a really high field, you get a lot of heating. So this is the this is the figure I was looking for. If you have a really high field, you get a lot of heating. Um, and so it turns out in these much shorter channels, we actually have to limit ourselves to how much voltage we're applying. So if you look at this plot, uh, I won't go into details about the um, the exact uh, you know experiment what they're looking for here, but it does show the number of theoretical plates uh, as a function of how much sample they've injected. And you can see what, at least compared to HPLC, look like pretty good theoretical plate numbers, right? Here's 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, so pretty good. Okay, let's compare that though, because they're, they're applying a pretty modest voltage here, 1260 volts. Let's compare that to what we see for CE. This paper, um, just so that I can show you what we're looking at, this is the original um, 1981 uh, James Jorgensen uh, capillary electrophoresis paper. This is where capillary electrophoresis was first described. And he has a plot in here, and unfortunately, it has a typo. Uh, I wish it didn't, but it does. Here's the, it's a somewhat similar plot. It's number of theoretical plates on the y-axis, but what you'll notice is it says n times 10 to the negative fifth. This is a typo. This should be times 10 to the fifth. Ignore that negative. So if this is times 10 to the fifth, what you're actually seeing is 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000 an order of magnitude higher theoretical plates here. And the reason, very simply, and if you read this paper, you will see it. The reason is that in CE, I'm gonna see if I can find the equation for you. In CE, the number of theoretical plates, here it is. The number of theoretical plates is directly proportional to that that I've highlighted right there, the voltage that you apply across the capillary. So if the capillary gets longer, you can apply a higher voltage, get a lower field, get less heating, uh, but still get the benefit of this really high theoretical plate count. It's kind of a neat phenomenon. Okay, so this was the first technique for injecting uh, sample onto these micro, <clears throat> micro devices. Um, it gives you a pretty simple electric field arrangement. This is going to make a little more sense when we see an alternative approach on the next slide. But basically the bottom line is, if uh, so if I do this in two steps, I apply voltage here, I load sample here, and then um, at... Uh, this point right here, at that moment, what I'm doing is I'm stopping the voltage that's going in this direction. I'm, I'm just setting it back to zero volts. I apply now a voltage from here to here, and all of the sample that filled up that intersection now becomes my injected sample plug right here. And it'll continue down this channel, and if we observe it down here, we'll see a separation of whatever constituents were in there. Um, but the point is, if I want to know what the field is in this channel, it's a very simple matter. It's just what's the voltage I'm applying here? What's the voltage I'm applying here? What's the length of this channel, right? Volts per centimeter. It's pretty simple. The arrangement we'll see on the next slide is a lot more complicated than that. Here's where um, you kind of pay a price, or here's where it, it doesn't perform great. Uh, and that is that you can't have variable injection volumes. I can't um, design a system like this where in one experiment I inject one nanoliter in the next experiment I inject three nanoliters. The volume I inject is a function of the geometry of the device. It's built into how big this intersection is. There's a way to get it bigger uh, and the way you do that is by not having this uh, cross T. It's called an offset T. So we're flowing sample up here. If this channel was just offset a few microns this way then what our sample would do to flow is it would come up here, it would turn the corner and it would go up that offset channel. And in that case, you get a larger volume that gets injected as your injection plug. But again, it's built into the geometry of the device. You get one injection volume. That's not always ideal. Sometimes you want to change that up. Um, the other thing is this pinched arrangement that I described to you. When we apply a small voltage to pinch the flow to get uh, these wings kind of limited in size, um, when we do that, we're actually, this is supposed to be a waste reservoir. This is where all of our, the you know, outcome of all of our separations go after we're done with them. And actually it requires us to flow some waste volume back up the capillary. Now if this is designed well, you can put a nice big volume reservoir down here because you don't care about volumes when they're in the waste. And what you're pumping back up the channel to make this work is a dilute sample of waste. So you don't care, so dilute you don't care. But the point is you are shoving junk back into your separation channel and that's not ideal. So let me show you a technique um, that addresses that. 
This is called the gated injection scheme, and we're changing stuff up a little bit here. If you look at the design of how the, the system is set up here, we basically switched where the background electrolyte and where the sample goes. So now we've got sample coming from the left, background electrolyte coming from the bottom. And the trick with this is we're going to apply positive voltage, positive voltage, negative voltage, negative voltage. Okay, and that allows us to get something that looks like this. So what's happening? Um, when we have positive voltage and negative voltage applied at all these places, flow wants to go from here, it wants to go that way. And it also wants to go, if I can get my arrow to work again, it also wants to go that way as well. It wants to go in both directions here. And the same thing is true from the bottom. It wants to go from the bottom straight up and it wants to go from the bottom and turn the corner. That's all just by electro, um, electroosmotic flow. Okay, the trick here is that the voltage you apply here is just a little bit larger. So the field you get in this channel is just a little bit larger than the field you get in this channel. That makes the electroosmotic flow coming out of this channel just a little bit higher than the electroosmotic flow coming out of this channel. And the net result is that the electroosmotic flow coming out of this channel with the buffer, which we don't see because it's not fluorescent, is enough to shunt, to gate the flow coming from the left and push everything from the left up the top. So when this thing is gating, which is under this condition, when flow is coming out of here and flow is coming out of here, all of the sample gets pushed around the corner to this waste. None of it makes it into the sample, um, sorry, into the separation channel. Um, if you momentarily withhold the voltage here, momentarily turn it off, then you get, let's see if we can stop at exactly the right moment. There we go. If we're momentarily withholding the voltage here, then we stop having buffer flow out of this channel. And that means that this sample can now break over that gate and start flowing in here. And as soon as we resume voltage again, we go back to our gated condition and we've injected a small plug. Uh, the trick here is that the size of that plug can be proportional to how long this thing is turned on or turned off. So you get this variable um, injection volume. Um, and the other thing that's really cool about this is the whole device is operated in continuous flow. In the pinched injection, we had flow going in this direction, then we stopped it, and then we made flow go in this direction. In this system, the only thing we're doing, we have one small channel here where flow starts and stops, but everywhere else, everything's continuous. I want to show you why that's useful. Um, this is the paper in which that injection scheme was invented. Um, this is by Steve Jacobson and Mike Ramsey. These are the two guys that are kind of associated with this kind of work. Steve Jacobson did his PhD uh, with, with um, George Giachan in our in our lab uh, in the lab that we now occupy, um, and uh, but all of this work you can see was done actually at Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, so here's why continuous flow is neat. Continuous flow is neat is because it allows you to incorporate additional processes online, automatic, no hands involved, no pipetting involved additional processes to your um, analysis miniaturized onto the device. So in this case, here's what it is. They have analytes, they're doing fluorescence detection, which is the main thing here. We've talked in the past about how fluorescence detection requires labeling, right? We need reagents to react with our uh, analytes. And so this device, um, which looks kind of weird, but just look at the lines. These are just the channels that are stuff's happening in. We have that classic cross, it's right there. They call it the injection cross, right? This is where that gating happens. But upstream of that, in the channel that would be the sample channel, we have analytes, these are not fluorescent, we have fluorescent reagents. And because they're in continuous flow, they never stop flowing with each other, you get a continuous reaction happening just before the injection in this kind of extra volume they call the reaction chamber. So the beauty here is um, that you can have basically uh, a really rapid reaction that happens immediately prior to your separation. Instead of having to do everything offline and getting kind of the inaccuracies of manually hand, um, processing your, your sample. The place that this has evolved to, by the way, in current literature, because you'll see this is, uh, what, 20, almost 30 years old, geez. Um, the place that this has evolved to is to have dynamic samples here. Samples that are like, for example, imagine you have cells that are growing here and the cells are releasing stuff to the environment. Well, now you can study the release that those cells make by CE separation and the whole thing could happen automatically, um, which has a lot of benefits of uh, reproducibility, of sensitivity, right? You don't need a lot of cells now to produce the kinds of volumes you need to create a reaction in such a small reaction chamber. Um, so a lot of cool, neat tricks here. The bottom line I'll tell you is that 
continuous flow is the trick to coupling extra stuff to your separation on these microfluidics. Uh, and this gated injection scheme is a continuous flow scheme. Um, the downside is that the electric fields are much more complicated. Because you're constantly applying a voltage and you've got one voltage in the middle of your device that you're turning on and off, it actually can be pretty hard to predict what are your electric fields where the separation is happening. And sometimes it becomes a trial and error process. Um, a more sophisticated approach, we'll show you on the next slide, is um, to use computer simulation and modeling to understand those electric fields. So here's an example. I showed you continuous flow and reactions as an example of something you can do pre-capillary. You can use electroosmotic flow to do some cool stuff post-capillary. This is actually work of mine. This is from when I was in grad school. Um, this is the paper that this comes from. Basically, what this is a, is a fraction collection device. If you want to do a separate, you have a complex sample. You want to do a separation by CE, but then what you want to do is you want to catch one peak and not the other. You can think about it as kind of a preparative scheme. That's not how we intended to use it, but you can imagine it that way as a preparative scheme. Um, and so let's look at the device geometry. Here it is. Here's our classic cross T geometry, and that means that this channel here, I'm circling that, becomes a separation channel. That's where all the separation is going to happen. We have sample, we have buffer, we're going to do a gated injection right here. But then when we get to the end of the separation, we're going to be able to take those peaks and using extra flow that comes in from these SF sheath flow, is what that stands for, sheath flow um, channels, we can use basically if there's, say, low channel coming, it's low flow, low EOF because of a low voltage coming through SF2, but high EOF coming through SF1, then what's going to happen is at this intersection, we're going to kind of like push all of the flow downwards. If you had equal flow through SF1 and SF2, it's going to go straight across. And if you have higher flow in SF2 than SF1, we're going to kind of push everything up towards these channels. So here's what that looks like. Let's take a look at the video of that thing working. This is the outlet of the separation channel. We're changing voltages applied in these sheath flow channels here and here. Uh, top and bottom here and it's causing the outlet to get pushed to these different um, channel outlets right there's really only one point here and that is that if you use something like computer simulation so here's computer simulation of some electric fields this is obviously the geometry that we did go with um, this is a you know a preliminary design that didn't do what we wanted it to do but if you use computer simulation to to kind of predict what these electric fields will look like and therefore what the flow will look like um, you can make really complex things like this fraction collector work. But the trick is those electric fields, uh, understanding those electric fields in a way that's much harder than just basic uh, algebra. Okay, so complex things with small volumes of solution. Um, let's look at how small we can get these volumes. This is no longer a separations technique. We're leaving the world of separations. I want to show you just how small these volumes can get. And this is through a technique called droplet microfluidics. So the idea with droplet microfluidics is the oil and water, they don't like to mix, right? Uh, but the other thing is that, you know, at these really small volumes, we've done this math, by the way, previously in the semester. When we talked about Reynolds number, we talked about uh, the channel dimension that stuff is flowing through being critical to determining the Reynolds number and the Reynolds number being critical to determine if you have laminar or turbulent flow. Okay, well, it turns out at these small channel dimensions with normal fluids like oil and water, it's almost impossible to get turbulent flow. Everything flows laminar. Um, and that's just a function of, of how small the channels are. Because of that, because everything flows laminar, you get extremely, extremely predictable flow. Basically, the fluid behaves in an extremely reproducible and predictable manner. Um, so here's what that means. In this example, uh, we no longer have a cross T. It's more like a ca an upside down capital T. There's one channel across the bottom, and this channel comes in and dead ends at it from the top. We're flowing oil down from the top and water from the left. What you can see, and they're flowing just at the same rate, or they're not the same rate. This is a little bit faster than this, but they're both flowing continuously. Nothing's ever stopping. Um, and what you see is that as the oil kind of bulges out into this main channel, it breaks off into these droplets. And one of the beauties here is these droplets are extremely reproducible in volume. So um, because they're dictated only by the behavior of the fluid, not by anything that we're doing, we're not mechanically breaking these droplets off, it's just the fluid behavior that makes it happen. We get really, really low relative standard deviations in the volumes of those droplets. They're extremely reproducible. Um, the ones that we're looking at here, 
these are somewhere between one and ten nanoliters, and that's a that's governed by the size of these channels. But it turns out you can make these channels really, really small, and so you can get picoliter volumes even smaller. You can you've even seen um, femtoliter droplets made in this way. So what are they useful for? A couple things are useful for. Probably the biggest one is that people view these as you can picture it as basically you want to do a reaction at extremely small scale. That's useful if you want to screen a lot of different reaction conditions and you want to do it fast, right? The smaller the volume, the faster a diffusion limited reaction is going to run. Um, so people use these like extremely small uh, reaction vessels uh, to screen lots of different reaction conditions. Uh, another good example, um, actually people do this in separation science, there's a guy named Bob Kennedy up at Michigan who's kind of pioneered the idea that, uh, so let's imagine Let's imagine for a second that we have a separation happening here. I know I said this was oil. Let's imagine this is our aqueous. There's a separation happening here, and we're dumping out um, the results of that separation into these droplets. Well, here's the beauty. Nothing from this droplet, the one that just went, can ever mix with that one, or with that one, or with that one. Each of these droplets become diffusion separated, right? We have essentially defeated now, at least to the scale of each of these droplets, the B term. Now, we can't keep separating once in the droplets, right? So, you know, we're only killing the B term post column. We're not killing the B term on the column, but at least it gives us some mechanism where we can save peaks in these little droplets. Um, we can save them forever if we want to. We can put them in a freezer for months and then come back and analyze them, and our peaks will not have diffused outside of their droplets because they can't. Okay. So that's that. The last technology I'm going to show you is kind of a play on this. Um, here's one thing that everything I've shown you so far has in common. Everything I've shown you so far, it's, it's performance, it's behavior, it's uh, application, inherently married to the geometry of these channels. Okay? Um, there is a field, a very niche field of microfluidics trying to defeat that principle. And that field is called digital microfluidics. So Digital microfluidics is a very complex concept, and if you really want to understand this, it's going to take some time in the literature and probably some time with Wikipedia as well. But the concept here is to is to have a generic array of electrodes. So what we're looking at in this video are some electrodes that I made on a glass slide. Um, this array of electrodes is very simple. It's just a row of electrodes plus this big two basically star-shaped and square-shaped electrodes. Um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrodes on the on the screen. These lines down here are just electrical connections off to some circuitry that runs this thing. Okay, eight electrodes is not that many, but you can easily design these things as two-dimensional arrays of many, many, many electrodes, and that's when stuff gets cool. It operates on the principle, so the, the idea is if you have a generic array of electrodes, you can produce droplets. This video just shows the production of a single droplet. So um, we'll talk about how this is working in just a sec. Basically, by careful application of voltage across these electrodes, I'm able to stretch this droplet out. And then at the very end here, I can stretch it in two different directions and pop off one little droplet. That has about a three, I think about a three nanoliter volume, if I remember correctly. This is a lot of years ago that I did this, so I don't really remember. But it's ballpark size, low nanoliter volume. Okay, so you can make that droplet kind of bounce around. I'm going to just, I think if this video does what I think it does, yeah, we're just going to transport it across these electrodes. And then, um, you know, we can uh, send it back to recoalesce with this big droplet. Really simple droplet manipulation. But you can imagine designing a more complex array of electrodes with multiple um, large droplets of different reagents and combining them in different ratios, for example. Um, all at the nanoliter scale with no need for pipetting, no er manual errors. So the way these things bounce around on these electrodes is a phenomenon called electro wetting. We don't have time to go into it and it's not really pertinent to separation science. So I'm gonna leave you to Google electro wetting and learn all about it. But it's a really neat phenomenon. Um, there, the, basically you can get the same advantages that you get in those droplet microfluidics, right? You can have these tiny volume reactors, you can break up volumes that can never mix back together again, which is can be really cool. Um, the benefit is the device performance is not dictated by channel design because you can have a generic array of electrodes that you use in one manner for procedure A, and the same electrodes can be used in a different manner, you know, different sequence of electrode actuation um, for process B or whatever. 
Um, here's the trick. This is a very niche technique, and it's only really done by three or four labs in the world. I tried to be old when I was a grad student. We tried to, to be one of them, and we weren't all that successful. We have one paper on this, and it's just it's just really hard. It's really tricky to make these things bounce around in the um, in the right way. That little tiny imperfections on the surface can make these droplets get stuck where they are, and they're they're done. They can't move ever again. So. Um, there's a limited number of labs that know all the tricks to make this work perfectly, um, and those are the labs that you see. The big one is a guy named Aaron Wheeler at the University of Toronto. He's the big name in this area. He's kind of invented his, his way through this. Okay, um, I think that's everything I want to tell you about microfluidics, just kind of as a teaser, as a, a taste for microfluidics. So here's the, the story. Um, Microtriploectrophoresis is all about miniaturizing and automating. This is the big deal. When you get to small volumes, you can't do this stuff manually, so you need ways to automate the manipulation of fluid. You can get some really complex manipulations of those fluids, and you can do some really in-depth automated analysis procedures if you carefully design electric fields for driving electroosmotic flow. One thing I think I didn't mention, I want to drop it in here, those droplet microfluidics things that I showed you, that is not electric fields. That's That's uh, pressure driven flow. So you don't need electric fields for that. That's kind of a separate thing. Obviously, electro wetting, the digital microfluidics, that is electric field. It's not electroosmotic flow, but it is electric fields. Um, so th there's this broader field. We looked at kind of the birth of microchip electrophoresis um, as kind of a motivation for making these small fluid these small volume fluid systems. Actually, this broader field of microfluidics, where my lab works um, quite extensively, has grown sort of out of these early CE things. So now people are doing all sorts of things in microfluidic formats that have nothing to do with CE. Okay, that's it for today. I'm gonna um, just kind of tell you what to expect next because this is the last lecture you're gonna be hearing from me this semester. Um, next week's lectures are all gonna be here. They're gonna be comprised of your presentations. I'm gonna add some text to help curate those presentations. I'm not just gonna slop them all into a um, just you know an announcement or discussion or whatever. I'm gonna try and put them thematically together and I'm gonna try and lead, uh, guide some discussion with some text there, but you're gonna be seeing your own presentations uh, next week. I want you to keep your eyes on Canvas for um, the grades that are all missing. Exam 2, presentation, homework and participation grades, which, by the way, we're always going to come at the end. Um, keep your eyes out. Sorry for the delay on exam 2. We're all just trying to cope with a bizarre situation. Um, I'm also going to, I want you to keep your eyes out for more details on the final exam. I'm going to do that by an announcement on Canvas, explain to you what the final exam is, when it's due. Um, it'll be due at our usual final exam time. It'll be submitted electronically, um, and I will just let you know when to expect to see it coming your way. Uh, okay, and then I guess the last thing is this uh, this this Douglas Adams reference. So if you're not a Douglas Adams fan, this is just the weirdest figure you could imagine. Um, if you are a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fan, you know what this is. I just wanted to say thank you guys for a great semester. Um, I never, ever imagined that my, the end of my uh, time at UT would end the way that it has this semester. But I gotta tell you, you guys have done something pretty amazing in my book. And that is to say that from my end, I don't know how it feels from your end, but from my end, I've had such quality engagements um, through comments on the discussion lectures and by email on, you know, things about your presentations and, and this kind of stuff. But actually being far away from you guys, as, as bummed out as it's made me, because there's no one to awkwardly stare at my bad jokes, um, it hasn't felt as disconnected as I thought it was going to. So anyways, I want to thank you guys um, for your attention and your time this semester. Uh, I want to thank you guys for for being dedicated scientists and uh, you know committing to the, the good fight in your career here. Um, and I want you to know that I am always available to you. So um, long after I've left UT, if you want to look me up at New Mexico State University, uh, I'd love to you know field emails from you. Ask me your separation science questions. I love this stuff. So I'd, I'd love to still be a resource for you. Take care, everybody, and uh, I'll see you around.